Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then I'm going to hand it over to Philip. My name is Seren Silva and I'm part of the Future Ready CMO organization, community, I should say. I'm really pleased to introduce Philip today. He's been a longtime friend, mentor, and collaborator of Infinite Edge, and we're really excited to have him share some of his cutting edge wisdom with us. Um, no doubt that's probably what drew you to this session today because Philip is an international culture catalyst. And I know some of you know him and have worked with him. I and mean, he's a teacher and advisor. He specializes in systemic and individual transformation, where he works with change leaders and innovators to ignite their teams, organizations, and ecosystems to create a thriving human future, something we all care about. He's worked with clients such as Siemens, Airbus, Vodafone, T-Mobile, Facebook, NBC Universal, and many startups and new innovation ventures. Without further ado, I'm going to hand um, the mic to Philip and uh, welcome and thank you. Well, thank you so much and uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today and ditto on uh, enjoying our connection over a long time. I've really enjoyed working with all of you and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and thank you all for joining us today. So wherever you're from around the world, we already talked about how it's morning and evening and everywhere and we're in internet time now. Because really where we do live is here, right on this beautiful blue planet in the middle of space. And uh, that's where I usually like to begin, right? Because if you want to think about who I am and what I'm doing, it's good to have some context, right? So if you think about this beautiful planet that we live on, in some ways, it's really more like a spaceship. Right? Because outside of this planet, it's not so conducive for human living, at least as of now. We'll see if we figure that one out eventually. But right now we're in the spaceship, and the problem is the spaceship is on fire. Right? There's all kinds of things happening. Right? We're looking at climate changes that are massive. We're over two degrees in our expectations right now, which to some extent get us to the point of 50-50 for 2050 here. Right? So it's really um, critical that we go step up. Right. So we have ecological changes that are also bringing about cultural changes, which is awesome. But we have organizations and movements like Fridays for Future, Me Too, Black Lives Matter. People are beginning to, to think there's something going on here that uh, we need to take care of right, and address and begin to do things in a different way. And of course, that all roots in individual evolution. Both employees as customers are looking for companies to be different. Right? We want to work in places that we can be proud of, but we know we actually contribute to our future rather than take away from it. And we also want to buy products and services from companies that we actually believe in. Right? And overall, we wonder what's the future going to be like? Right? And how can we contribute to it and how can we create it? And in all that, there's this whole big shift of how we organize ourselves. Right? In the past, we thought of big organizations sort of like tankers. And if you did your job really well, you climbed up the ladder, one day you might become the captain of the tanker and you tell everybody where to go, right? And you steer that big ship and it's hard to steer because it's such a big ship. Right? But that's actually not true anymore. Right? Thanks to the, especially thanks to the advent in technology, we have, you know, with a $25 smartphone, you have access to all the information. And so now organizations are becoming more like drone swarms where every single part of the, the swarm is the sensor of the organization needs to be able to make decisions in favor of the overall purpose of where the organization is moving. And that requires a completely new organization system, right? how we organize ourselves, you know, sort of an operating system, which I'll get back to. But what we do know is we need new kinds of leaders, we need new kinds of capacities to work together in these volatile and uncertain, complex and ambiguous times. We need processes for innovation everywhere in the organization, not just in small little innovation departments, right, where everybody can look at their job and consider how they can do that better and act on signal that they're perceiving. We need new structures for accountability and action, where we can really look at how can we get away from these hierarchical systems and create different structures that allow us to be more flexible and adaptable to ever-changing demands. And with that comes to be also understand that there's continuous business evolution that everything has a certain lifetime and eventually goes away but there's impermanence of everything and we also have more transparent brands and cultures meaning that what happens on the inside isn't hidden anymore like back in the day we could hide away and have a really crappy toxic culture and have a very nice marketing branding veneer out here and look pretty to the public but in a world of transparency that's not working anymore either so today, though, we want to focus on this whole idea of new leaders. And why do I say we need new leadership? Well, if our current leadership and leadership training was working, we wouldn't have to worry about whether we're going to be here in 100 years. 
And we would have different kinds of leaders that actually focus on the future and the legacy that they're leaving behind. And people in the last few years have started to understand the idea of ecological footprint, right? What I'm leaving behind and that I consume things and my consumption patterns and how I'm showing up every day actually has long-term consequences that I'm leaving behind me. But as leaders, I'm always been more interested in sort of the handprint, right? To just say, hey, you know, who am I? Who have I been here? Right? If you think about from the very first person in a cave who sat there and put his hand in the mud and put it on the wall, right? They said, I was here, I mattered. Look, this is what I've done. So think about your legacy. Right? One day you will probably be dead. I'm sorry if that's news to you, and I'm sorry if that's shocking. People are working on that whole life extension thing, but in all likelihood, all of us are gonna die eventually, which is kind of okay because we have eight billion people on this planet and we can't just keep growing, right? But what are you leaving behind then? Right? One day when you're gonna be dead, who do you wanna have been? Right? And been, not just what have you done or what have you known, because in some ways that's less relevant, right? But who do you have been when you're dead? Or put on shortly before you die? And we look at the big context here, right? In general, how pretty much nearly every system or every organization starts, right? At first, we have very few systems as things that are structured and we are kind of muddling through with all hands on, right? Then we get some certain level of repeatability. Eventually, we develop some process discipline. Eventually, we begin to integrate all the different pieces. And this is sort of where we've been, right? But then we go into learning systems, into purpose-driven expansion and ultimately dynamic creation systems. And if you think about it, Kind of mirrors our evolution as humans and of course it's not as linear right? there's lots of back and forth and parallels but we started with hunting gathering where every day was a new day and we always tried something new then we got into agriculture did things repeatedly and ultimately industrial edge and in the age of optimization and so initially it was about survival then repeatability then growth and optimization and that was when we had relative certainty now we're in this threshold here where we move into uncertainty, right? More and more things are uncertain, even though we have more data than ever, things are also moving faster than ever. And so we need to have more experiments and learn what this new world is about, right? And create continuous evolution where we create integrative solutions and ultimately focus on meaningful outcomes. And there's different kinds of leadership that comes with different levels, which I'll get back into a bit more. But what I want to start with is here, this idea of expert and achiever. Right? The expert is what we train to be in school still. Right? We're supposed to learn something, and then we go to university or something, then we learn our job, and then we do that for the rest of our lives. Right? We're the expert now. But knowledge is changing so quickly. Right? And probably many of you who worked in an organization were probably hired because of your degrees or because of your expertise. But then you quickly learn that it's really about whatever is happening day to day in the business, and you learn to be achievers, right? learn to optimize towards certain KPIs and really manage manage a business right, and really create outcomes. But what we need now is this whole field. Right? We need catalysts, we need servant leaders, we need creation leaders, we need people who can handle life in uncertainty. And then it's less about knowing and it's more about who you are. And if you look at the World Economic Forum, they, a couple of years ago, put out this list to say, hey, skills of the future, right? It's innovation, learning, problem solving, analysis, resilience, creativity, leadership, ideation, emotional intelligence, technology. Notice something? This is none of those things, so very few of these things are actually about having knowledge. They're about the ability to acquire knowledge and solve things with it. Right? Because there's different kinds of learning. In school, typically, we're trained with this idea of becoming specialists, right? so-called eye learners, right? go really, really deep in a vertical and learn something really well. And that's good. We'll always need some specialists. But you know, if you're a complete specialist, in German, there's a word called Fachidiot, which means you're a subject idiot. Right, because you only know your little vertical. Right? And so it's important to at least you know, look a little bit to the left, look a little bit to the right and see what's going on around me. Right? What are the other people doing around me in other disciplines that I maybe can learn from or draw insights from, right? for my own expertise. And then we've had this beginning of people who are sort of M learners, right? who have two verticals, right? for example, technology and finance or marketing and sales or marketing and finance or marketing and IT, right? or marketing and technology in terms of social media now. Right? So we have multiple verticals and we can make connections between them. But what we really need now though is X learners, right? people who are constantly learning whatever needs to be learned whenever it needs to be learned and who are continuously learning. 
on continuously stretching and expanding themselves and growing past new thresholds. What does it have to do with leadership? Well, the original word leader actually means to go before as a guide. It means actually crossing a threshold. It means learning something new, doing something new, and sharing that with others. And so a leader is someone who's willing to go ahead and go before. And it's a little bit different from management. We kind of confuse these terms a lot, right? When we talk about leadership in organizations, most of those people are actually not leaders. They're actually managers first and foremost, right? Because they're focused on distributing work. While leadership is actually about developing people, first and foremost yourself, and then the people around you, right? Because you're willing to go before as a guide and to take other people with you. And so it's a little bit different from management. So we actually need to make that distinction because a lot of people who are in leadership positions today are really good managers and they're excellent at managing towards results, optimizing p &Ls, you know, uh, achieving certain KPIs, but they're not necessarily being trained to develop people or even themselves. And so there's these different levels of leadership, like I mentioned earlier, right? we have opportunists, we have diplomats, we have experts and achievers. Those were the typical kind of leaders that have been around, right? From the first warlords who just went for whatever they wanted to a bit more, you know, territory builders and kings who were sort of diplomats to the experts, right? Especially since the age of enlightenment in quotation marks, it was all about rational thinking and the rational mind and experts. To then, especially since the 90s, when kind of finance took over and made sure that our KPIs are right, right? We got to focus on achieving, 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 achieving. And this is really about what you do to get what you want. What we need now, though, is really this next level where we need catalysts who are transforming themselves and each other and the organizations around them, where we have people who focus on being of service and not just making it about their own success, but making it about the success of everyone because we live on this one planet. Right? And if people lose, we all lose in the end. Right? And this is one of the things that doesn't work anymore. We can't win in one place and other people lose somewhere else. We have to create new structures where we're all serving each other. And ultimately, creation, right? ultimately really being an agency and consciously co-creating the future rather than waiting for it or being in an isolated little bubble where I only care about my work, but actively participating in the future that we want to create. And on those levels of leadership, it's really more about being, right? who I'm showing up as. Because I don't know either. And I work with a lot of futurists. They don't know what the future looks like. Nobody does. And so as we approach the future, it's really relevant who we be, not necessarily what we know, because a lot of our knowledge today is already kind of obsolete. Not to say that we can't learn from the past and stand on the shoulders of giants. But this is really the idea that leadership is, is the process of expanding the capacity to create in self and in others. And it starts with yourself, right? It starts really with your own relationship to yourself and right? all those little voices in your head, right? How are you talking to yourself? How are you using your connection to what the Romans called genius, right? Your higher self, your potential of who you could become. And then being in relationship with that continuously, that's the first step of leadership, leading yourself and self-leadership, personal mastery. And then the next step is to support someone else in doing that. So leadership is not about telling them what to do, but it's about supporting them in being creators as well, so that they can then do that for others. Right? Leaders create leaders who create leaders. And ultimately we want to create leaderful environments and cultures where we support each other in being our best version of ourselves. Right? So we can all really learn and grow. And in my work, we look at leadership so in this very basic model where it starts with awareness, right? And then it goes into responsibility and ownership. Right? So there's these things that I'm aware of. And leaders continuously expand their awareness, take responsibility for things that are theirs to address, and are ultimately in ownership of their life. But in the ownership of who you are and who you define yourself to be, that determines your identity. But who you be determines your identity. And who you consider yourself to be then allows you to have certain actions available to you that create certain outcomes. Those of you who are familiar with Coaching models will see this a typical ontological coaching model here, right? Mindset determines behaviors, determines outcomes. My identity, who I think I am, determines the actions that are available to me that then create certain outcomes or not. But the key here with this awareness is that there's situational awareness and strategic awareness. I'm just the awareness in the moment in what's happening around me right now and being able to be in tune with that and be connected to that. 
And there's also the strategic awareness, like the deliberate practice, whether it's a morning ritual or the strategic planning sessions, like we really take a moment to stop everything, to expand your awareness and really think about what's really going on. And awareness requires vulnerability, right? because sometimes the things we become aware of are not so nice. Right? When someone provides you feedback, for example, around how you're showing up, right? it might hurt, it might sting at first a little bit, because you thought you were doing a good job. And then you're finding out it's not working. Like, or you become aware of patterns of yourself or behaviors of yourself that are not serving you, that have, might have served you in the past, but are not serving you any longer. And that can hurt. Right? So we have to be willing to be vulnerable when we're growing our awareness. We have to have that growth mindset right? and really be open to continuous learning and expanding ourselves. And responsibility takes courage. Right? We have to be willing to step up. And sometimes against the odds, especially now we're we'll in the middle of massive transformations, a lot of the old system will fight back even. Right? We, every system has an immune system, whether personal or organizational. Right? There is a tendency to defend the status quo inside of ourselves, inside of our teams, inside of our organizations. So we have to have the courage to speak up, and the courage to do something new, the courage to try out things that are maybe not familiar yet. And ultimately step into stewardship. Right? And this is where we come to identity and where it informs our identity, right? Where we really take a role of co-creation, where we choose to be creators of the future, right? Instead of victims, right? Or architects of the future instead of victims, as Bucky Fuller said. And this is really like the key here, right? And you'll learn, as I said, those of you who know a little bit about coaching will know that it's actually the most effective way to shift my outcomes. Is if I want to create new outcomes, is of course new actions, but it starts with new identity. But if I choose to change who I be, suddenly I have all kinds of things available to me that weren't available before. And so it's about being who I am, who I define myself as, who I think of myself as, my own notion of identity. And for most of, most of us in school, you know, I've been taught to be good little extremely manipulative process executors. Right, carrot and whip, right? We, we go to school, we do the things because we have to, right? Or go to job and do the job because we have to, right? And we get job descriptions that tell us exactly what to do, right? And then we know what to do because we're hired for that role and we just execute on what we're doing. Well, again, that, that works sort of when things are stable and relatively not changing. Right? But if things are changing, we need people who are capable of creating, right? people who are capable of. Uh, doing new things and partner knows what's up. Apparently, somebody is uh, blowing things up. But uh, we have to become intrinsically motivated value creators. And a lot of my job actually is shifting employees or good little executors into entrepreneurs, into people who are intrinsically motivated. And that's what we want now. We want people to understand the big picture and act on it autonomously so that they can be like that drone swarm that we talked about a moment ago. And so, where do you start? There's a beautiful quote by Aldous Huxley, who's one of my favorite authors, and he says, the only one corner of the universe you can be certain of improving is your own self. That's the only thing you can ever do. Right? I might want to change the world, and I might want to do all kinds of things for my organization and lead transformation and innovation and all these things, but it starts here with who I be, right? with who, how I'm showing up every day and how I'm understanding myself as a human. And this is really about actively creating yourself. I love the imagery of alchemy, where there's an old alchemical picture where the person is in, in, I am the lab, right? I am my own lab. I'm gonna burn things, meaning I'm gonna learn how to frustrate my desires and learn how to, you know, be focused on what's really important right now and not what I want right now, right? I'm gonna learn how to dissolve myself again and again. Right, and dissolving in terms of my ego or my identity or who I was yesterday, right, and trust, and dissolve and trust. I'd right, have to learn how to separate what's what. I'd right, have to bring it all back together, and maybe let it ferment for a moment and see what happens, distill the wisdom from it, and ultimately, you know, coagulate it into a new identity. And that process of alchemy, right, turning lead into gold, actually describes personal transformation. It describes the alchemist transforming him or herself to become uh, wisdom, beauty, something higher of higher value. And so we get to use ourselves as a laboratory. And let's say, you know, ourselves as a laboratory, 
Now there is that creation that wants to come through each of us. But there's always creation coming in, right? And every force in physics has a counter force, right? So there's resistance coming. But you might want to have this, you might have this great idea for a new project, but then the question arises, am I good enough? Am I allowed to do this? Can I do this? Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll do it later. Oh, maybe it's someone else's job, right? There's all kinds of resistance that comes up when you feel creation <clears throat> coming through you. And so leadership in some ways is about unlocking your creative throughput. Right? So you can produce more, create more. And not in the sense that we need to optimize and create more, but in the sense of, let that thing that wants to emerge for you actually emerge for you. And for that, again, you have to focus on who you are and your operating system. But then I love that term operating system. I grew up with technology, but I loved it even more when I looked into what it actually means, right? Because your opus is your creation, is your work. But you know, maybe from classical music, when we talk about the opus of Mozart or Beethoven with opus number so-and-so, but it's their work, it's their creation. Right? And we're a system that where things go in, things go on, things come out. And so our operating system is really just the instrument of creation that we have available to us. And if you look at the human operating system, why right, there's stuff going in, stuff going on, stuff coming out. And ultimately that output is then feedback again. It's like your whole reality right now. Everything in your world, even that you hear right now, is your feedback. Every single choice you ever made in your life brought you right here. How you operate brought you right here. And if you think about this operating system, there's multiple levels. And I use this little chakra guy, you know, because I learned it for yoga when I was a kid. Uh, but ultimately, around the world, people have different maps of the human operating system that kind of come down to some of the basic same things. And they also pretty much that we seem to have these different circuits or capacities where right? we have a body which allows us to sense or to have eyes and ears and five senses that give me information and also a body that has wisdom and intelligence. Right? We have got feelings and we feel something in our bones, right? we have that intelligence that's there too. We also have emotions, we feel things, right? we like certain things, we feel drawn to certain things and we don't feel in good world, other things, right? We have intuitions that move us towards or away from things, right? And all kinds of emotions that allow us to process information in that way. And of course, there's the mind. But I think therefore I am a bunch of white men a few hundred years ago thought that was the apex of evolution and that emotions and body were for women and children because we're so rational now, right? But they misunderstood this idea that this is not a hierarchy, right? One of these is not necessarily better than the other. We have all of those things. It's a whole key in that sense. Everything is its whole piece of its own, but then works in concept. And the mind is not it yet, because we also have that next level, which is where a lot of humanity is waking up to right now, is that relational intelligence, right? To understand that I can be self-authoring and make choices. And of course, we have a voice, right? And the voice we're using right now, of course, but more in the sense of your individual self. I think about it, nobody's ever been you. Right? You are number one. You're the very, very first version of you. Nobody in this entire world has had your experience, has your genes, epigenetics, nature, and nurture, everything that has ever happened to you. You bring a completely unique perspective. And you're the very first one to do this. Right? So next time you beat yourself up about not being good enough, as compared to what? Right? Because you're the very first one doing it. Right? You're expressing yourself. And then we have the capacity for vision, which originally evolved to anticipate danger, which is why we're really, really good about imagining all the horrible things that could happen and not so good about imagining the good things, right? But why it's even more important to train your vision and to train yourself to envision the future, envision your own future, even every day. And ultimately we have that calling, right? We all have it in dreams and weird things, situations, synchronicities around us where we have sort of this idea that there's something to do here for us. And these come together with certain needs as well. Some of you might be familiar with Maslow, right? And Maslow talked about how we have physiological needs, right? We need food, we need water, for example. We even need touch, sleep, all kinds of things. But the physiological needs, we have emotional needs, we have safety needs, right? We want to feel okay, we want to feel like we're going to be okay tomorrow, even. We want to have that sense of safety. Right? We also have Esteem needs, we want to feel good about ourselves, we want to feel like our contribution matters, right? which is so harsh for so many people in this reality today. Think of how few people get acknowledged for what they bring to the table every day, 
how many employees show up and really bring their full self and bring their dedication, bring their wisdom, intelligence to their work, and are not even seen for it when their self-esteem crumbles. So the easiest thing you can do on that note, acknowledge people, right? acknowledge your employees continuously and let them know that they're doing great. There's wonders for your self-esteem. And of course, it comes from others. Right? We have social needs. We want to feel like we belong to someone. We want to feel like we're integrated. But beyond that, we also have a need to actualize ourselves, right? to really become us, whatever that means. And this is the adventure journey of being, right? where I don't know who I'm going to be next year yet. And it's awesome. I have some visions of who I want to become and that I'm orienting myself on. There are so many things that can happen between now and next year. I don't know. This is your adventure, right? This is the adventure journey that you are on and really becoming yourself and finding out who that even is. And right? finding all the depths of who you are and all these hidden talents that you haven't even thought about yet, that haven't come to the surface yet because there hasn't been an opportunity. You can think about how 80% of our jobs today will probably be gone in 10 years, 20 years, because they'll be replaced by further automation. It also means there's a whole bunch of completely new things available and new situations available. And who could you be then? We don't know yet. This is the exciting part. And originally, Maslow had stopped at self-actualization, but then he realized that it's kind of an ego trip, right? Because it's me doing me. Right? And he realized that that only makes sense if we put it in service to something higher, right? if we transcend ourselves and really understand that we are here to serve life. We're here to serve something bigger than ourselves, and that that really is the, the more complete version of who we are. And in the end, we look for meaning. And in meaning comes from German meinen, which means to make mine. Right? I'm making my life my own, really living my life and the life that you came here to be. So think about your life and what is the highest and most exciting adventure that you can live here. And there's different capacities that come with that. And so I'm going to take the next few minutes to kind of just walk you through that yourself and take a moment to think about um, how embodied do you feel? When you think about your body right now, that you're probably sitting on a chair, maybe it's your morning, maybe it's the afternoon, maybe you sat on your chair all day long in front of the Zoom camera, or right? maybe you're actually in the office somewhere, who knows? Right? But what's your body like? How connected do you feel to that? How embodied do you feel? Do you feel like you're, you're taking care of it, you're waking it up, you're feeding it well, and you're hydrating it well? Right? I'm going for airport security. Sometimes it might be that too. Right? But you know, um, how embodied are you feeling? Right? How connected do you feel to your body? And how attuned do you feel to your emotions and the emotions around you? And take a moment to think about all the different emotions that you maybe already had today. Like in the matter of the day, we go up and down, you feel great, feel shitty, you feel great, feel shitty, you feel super awesome, you feel like we're the last unnecessary thing, right? Typically, we're kind of going back between visions of grandeur and self inflation and crippling self doubt, right? Somewhere in between, all kinds of emotions. And there's all kinds of emotions around us, right? And how in tune are you with that, with the people around you? Right? How empathetic are you? Or maybe even too much. Right? Some people I know who are empaths have a really hard time just determining whose emotion is it anyway. And we have that thing in our brain called neuro neurons, right? that is limbic resonance, meaning that if someone around us um, feels feel something strongly, we will also feel that a little bit. Right? If someone walks in angry, we become a little bit more angry. You might have had that experience, like where you maybe at a meeting somewhere, and suddenly the, the, the mood shifted, and you don't even know why, but it was maybe because someone walked by who was angry. Right? So if you're empathetic, and especially if you're very empathetic, you will pick up other people's emotions all the time. And so then it's important to have your own emotional set point, right, and know what you want to feel. So you're not constantly being pulled and pushed and pulled all over the place by other people's emotions. When you think about discernment, the idea of rational thinking, well, we want to think of ourselves as rational, and even in organizations we want to think that people are behaving rationally, but how much rationality is really there? Well, we have all kinds of cognitive bias, right? all of us, we can't avoid that because it's our brain is built that way, and it's actually to some extent helpful, right? some of these cognitive biases save us a lot of time and effort because we don't have to think about everything again. Right? But how often do you stop and pause and actually look at your own biases, right? look at your own belief systems? And a lot of our beliefs came from someone else. 
Right? They came from mother, father, preacher, teacher when we were little. Right? They told us what the world is like and how things are. And then we adopted those beliefs and many people never actually even check them and wonder about how am I, why do I believe this even? Or where does this belief come from? So to really check in with yourself every now and then and, and focus on your own discernment, focus on your own rationality and question yourself and question everything. And questions your idea of who you are. And then relating. Right? And relating starts with relating to yourself, as I said earlier. Right? How am I relating to myself? How am I you know, dealing with these voices in my head? Right? If you don't have them, lucky you. Most people I know have all kinds of little voices in their head all day long. And they're not necessarily friendly here and there, but right? until you actually transform those relationships and then they become helpful guides. But initially, typically, they tend to yell at you a lot. Right? And so the part of relating here starts with relating to yourself and finding a way to relate to yourself. So think about that for a moment of how, how are you relating to yourself? And how are you relating to others? When you walk into a room, do you assume that everybody is your friend? Where do you assume that you don't belong? What's your basic assumption there? When you call a client or when you work with your team, or work with your boss or work with other people in the organization across silos, do you feel like that's okay? Or do you feel like, you know, you shouldn't? Right? Where do you hold yourself back in your own relating? Any expression. We tend to hold ourselves back in our expression a lot. I grew up in Germany, and in Germany, it's a little bit self expression, it's a little bit like playing a whack a mole game. Right? So, as soon as you're coming up, you know, someone's pushing you down, right? Because don't stand out too much from the crowd, right? Because we control each other and make sure that we are, you know, not going crazy here. Right? And especially a little bit at the moment, a lot. And uh, pretty much everybody is wearing black at the moment. And I used to wear black all the time, it's my favorite color. I had especially when I lived around the world and I just lived on a suitcase, I essentially had a stack of black things and I could just put on whatever and it always worked. But now uh, I decide to wear white more, right? just to be different and just to allow someone else's self-expression and encourage their self-expression. Right? Because I can encourage self-expression in two ways. I can be quiet and hold back and leave space for someone, or I can you know, be express myself so that I tell them that it's okay to do so. And sometimes it's uncomfortable when we express ourselves. But you know, it takes courage from back to responsibility. It takes courage like when we become aware of something that we should speak up about, right? something that's not okay. It takes courage to actually say things sometimes. But it's necessary because silence is consent. Right? If I'm not speaking up, if I'm holding back my voice, if I'm holding back the things that are important to me, and essentially accepting the status quo. And so that's why it's so important that you express yourself, but that you really think about who you are and what you want to create here. What do you want to make happen in the world? And what's your fullest self-expression? And then think about your vision. Right? Because as I said earlier, it's easy to imagine the bad. Right? It's easy to think of all the things that could go wrong. The word worry actually comes from the German word Wilgen, which means to choke. Because that's what happens. That when we worry, we choke ourselves. And apart from the fact that when we worry, our blood is in our arms and legs and not in our brain, which doesn't make for good thinking, it also means that we typically hold back and we kind of stop. Right? So important to learn how to vision the future positively. When I start my day in the morning, I look at all the meetings I have that day and I imagine the outcome of it, of how I want to feel afterwards of you know, what's, what's been created afterwards. And imagine that as vividly and as excitedly as I can, because that vision will pull me through the day. And it doesn't guarantee that things go that way, but it will make it more likely. Right? So what are you imagining? What are you constantly imagining about your job, about your company, about your life? Right? What are the thoughts that are cursing in your head around the future? Because it's easy to, you know, look at the future and say it's all going to go to crap. Right? As I said, 50-50 by 2050 is pretty much what I'm looking at right now. Right? And it's easy to look at all the potential failure parts in our organization. And this is also why you as marketers are so particularly important. Right? Because as marketers, you're storytellers. Right? You are creating the future by telling stories. Right? You're creating new narrative identities for 
your customers, but really for the world. And so the stories you tell us, Marcus, the visions you share are key to our future. And who do you need to be? Right? Who do you want to be? Do you want to be the person who has all these negative things to imagine? Or do you want to be the person who envisions what the future could look like, what's exciting and enticing that we want to be part of? And ultimately calling. Right? Really that connection to yourself, to your higher self, to that thing that you know nudges you here and there. How much time are you creating for that for yourself? How much connection are you creating there? How much are you allowing yourself to simply be sometimes? Because for those things to come in, we have to get rid of the noise. If you're bombarded by social media all day long and emails all day long and people all day long and stuff all day long, it's really hard to listen to this, right? Because this is very subtle signals. But who do you, who do you have to be to actually be that, be someone who is connected to their calling, who checks in with themselves every day? It looks what's my highest will right? because my will my highest self is ultimately all i have to do here because we don't know what the future holds we don't know anything but we can know how we want to show up and what kind of future we want to create and who we need to be for that so this is a process right? and it really starts with self-care right? If I want to create space, if I want to create things out there, the first thing I have to do is I have to take care of myself. I have to look at my operating system and look at all these different needs that I have and figure out how can I support them. And then I can build habits where I self-regulate towards where I want to go, towards my vision, and ultimately continuously cultivate myself and create a vision of who I want to be. And in that, we always change. My partner said, follow said, I seem to be a verb. I'm always changing. And so be kind. I think that's the most important thing. If there's one rule in the universe, I would say be kind. First and foremost to yourself. We're all learning right now. We're all learning who to be. So be kind to yourself. Be kind to others. Understand that it's difficult to be an individual, right? to stand out. It's by default, you're other. Right? And so allow yourself, create yourself a foundation that allows you to be yourself, to be an individual. Because culture is an emergent phenomenon. If individuals show up differently, the whole thing shows up differently. And the very least you can do is create little pockets of sanity, or islands of sanity, as my colleague Margaret Whitley calls them, around your team, your silo that you're working in, in your organization, your sphere of influence. When you show up differently, when you be differently, that becomes different too. And in the end, nobody cares how much you know. Right? until they know how much you care. And that's about being who you be, what you care about. And so think about what's really important to you, what really matters to you. And do that and learn whatever you need to learn, because this is your legacy. Right? As Marshall McLuhan said, there are no passengers in Spaceship Earth, it's only crew. And we are all crew, learning what that means, learning what we need to know to be that. So with that, Think about this beautiful planet and how you're contrib uh, contributing to it. And I'll leave you with that and think about who you need to be to be the most glorious version by the time you die one day. And, you know, and we could talk for hours longer. This is one of my problems, but I'm going to leave it to you. I think we have a couple of questions, right? Sorry. Well, the said it's difficult to stand out comfortably. Absolutely. Yes. And I think being comfortable, being comfortable with discomfort, I think is one of the key capacities for the future. Right? And this is really what, what you need to learn in order to learn, like just stretching yourself and know that you're always okay and that you're not okay at the same time. Because there's always more. There's always more to learn. Thank you, Philip. That was, for me, based in the U.S., it was a great way to start the morning to think about these larger questions of who we want to be. Because when we think about driving change, we think outward first. And I think much of what you're centering on is really starting with ourselves. 
in terms of becoming the leader that we want to be. Um, so we're going to move into Q&A now. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand and I will um, unmute you. It looks like Daniel's po posed a question. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, this question does say that right, is uh, how is there any way to help others who we care for for the journey of self-actualization? Okay. Uh, yes, I think first and foremost, by being you, right, by being an example, by being transparent about your learning too, right, where you are sharing your process, where you're vulnerable about your process, and you're letting people know what's happening for you, right, and sharing your journey. And I think especially now that we have, most of you are explorers at the edge, right, and so People don't know what it looks like out there. So share that, right? share your experiences and invite them into their own journey. You can see, have conversations with them and find out where they're at and what their next step might be, right? Because you might want them to be over here, but that might be too much of a stretch, right? So starting with caring, right? Letting them know how much you care about them and then finding out how can you move them one step further from there. Alex. Uh, yeah. Hello, Philip. Alex Pesek here. Uh, good. Thank you for the beautiful journey again. Uh, my question is this vulnerability that it takes to focus inwards first. Uh, there are people that are open for that, and there are people that are shy of looking to the inside. Now, the question is, is it a better strategy as a change agent to focus on those who are already there? Or do you also have observations and means to nudge people carefully into, come, discover, play with it. And then once you're playing with it, you feel comfortable going deeper and hence impact overall will be bigger. Yeah. Well, there's definitely that whole, look, the water's warm, it's fun, check it out, right? So there's a bit of that. <laughs> and to your point, if you look at sort of the innovation adoption curve, right? You have your innovators and you have your early adopters, your early majority, et cetera. Like I work mostly with innovators and early adopters, right? Like yourselves. I'm mean, pretty sure everybody here is on that in that early bracket, right? But then tell their stories so that then the early majority, if the story is here enticing enough, the early majority will come and they'll move the curve further. Right. So in terms of change agents in organizations, I find it's it, you can spend a lot of effort, a lot of time, and a lot of money on trying to market to the laggards. Right? But they will resist your message anyway. They will not take it from you, but they will take it from the early majority, from the late majority, and the late majority will take it from the early majority. So I think it's really find the freaks. You know, say, let's start freak with two E's. Right? Find the people who are already free a little bit uh, and start there. Right? Find those people in, in organizational um, programs that we do. We typically use self selection too, like we invite people to programs and the people who are willing. Right, the sort of the coalition of the willing, that's where we start. Right? And then we tell their stories and make them the examples right? because we want to create these new archetypes, right? these new hero stories. Well, this is, this is a great employee, right? Check this person out and look what they're doing. Right? So I think don't, don't fo focus on the back end. Right? The back end is going to be moved by the front end, <clears throat> meaning the early majority, and the, that will move them. So I would, I would focus as change agents on your fellow innovators so that you don't feel completely alone, right? Find the others in the organization so you don't feel like the only freak. Um, and then focus on the early adopters and maybe early majority and then tell their story, tell their story, tell their story, right? So that it becomes the new cool thing to do for everybody. Does that make sense? Thank you, beautiful. <clears throat> Philip, this is um, this is Mary. Thank you so much for all that wisdom today. It kind of unleashed uh, some emotions in me. I found myself really feeling emotional. Um, and when we're going through <clears throat> these change processes as dramatically as we are now, and we're learning new ways of being vulnerable and allowing other people to be vulnerable, I mean, it can unleash a wave of you know emotion around you. And I, you know, I know you're from Germany. Um, and I have, you know, and from the, the, you know, Scandinavian German, you know, ancestry as well. And we like, you know, we, we like suppress our emotions and suppress everybody's emotions around us. So like, how do we handle this? Because this can be kind of overwhelming as we start to allow these parts of us that are so important to navigating the future, but they're so uncomfortable to so many of us. 
you know, it's like, it feels like it's just sort of unleashing everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, I grew up in Germany, you know, I was very good at suppressing my emotions too, and being a man on top of that, and you know, the whole boys don't cry thing. All right, so I had to actually, it was a journey to connect to that again. Um, and then, you know, like once I opened that, I'm like, oh shit, there's a ton of stuff there. Right? And vulnerability for me is actually the most underestimated form of power. Mm -hmm. right? Because if you're vulnerable, nobody can say anything. Mm -hmm. If you're saying, hey, this is who I am, this is what I got, right? go make fun of my missing hair or whatever, great. I mean, nothing, nobody can do anything. Like, you can't do anything to you in that moment. But in a bit of a religious land, but in a way that's even the story of Jesus on the cross, right? He's not up there saying, you bastards for putting me up here. This is horrible. You all suck. He says, forgive them because they don't know what they do. I know who I am. This is a very vulnerable position here. It hurts. It's really horrible. But I'm choosing who I want to be in this. Right? And when you're vulnerable, there's nothing anybody can do to you in some ways. Right? Because you're already putting it out there. So even I think in Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, he even talks about the idea of taking the wind out of someone else's sails. Right? And it's one of the tools of, you know, when you have that uncomfortable conversation to start with, hey, I know I really screwed up and I really screwed that up. And then forgive me, can we talk about this now? But if you start with putting it out there instead of trying to hide it, <laughs> so much easier. Right? Yeah. Because think about how much energy you spend hiding emotions and hiding yourself and containing yourself. Yeah, yeah. You could have that energy available for something else. And sometimes you might have to sit around and cry for a moment. It's also okay. You know, I mean, I'm fine with your team. When I, mean, I get emotional with my team, we get emotional with each other. If things are really emotional, and that happens. And sometimes that, you know, even takes precedence or priority over getting something done in the moment because if you're doing it for a fake point, if you're doing it for a place where we're holding back or we're not really authentic, the work product is also going to reflect that. Yes. Right. So it's important to actually take the time, blush it out, right? Deal with it. Right? Take the time to cry or scream or punch something if you need to, get it out of your system. Then you can actually look at it more rationally afterwards. That's really resonating with me, Philip. This is Seren. Um, being able to put your vulnerability out there, it's something that I've been playing with more because I have gotten exhausted holding it all in all the time. And I don't think it benefits people, but I do think it's the tool of how do you, how do you allow for that vulnerability with it within a team if you're the only one who's kind of starting it. But I think you spoke to that earlier when you said, you know, find the tribe, right? I mean, A, someone has to start it. Right? I mean, you can all wait for someone else to be the first, right? I mean, this is one of those things about leaders, right? Leaders go first, right? Leaders are willing to go there, right? And so uh, by setting the tone and by being vulnerable in your team, you know, you at least bring that resonance into the team. And it might take a moment for people to catch up with that, and it might even make fun of you initially, right? I mean, oh, it's Sarah again with her tears, you know what I mean? Or oh, whatever, right? They might make fun of you at the beginning, but eventually they'll really get to appreciate that perspective because it gives them permission to go there. Right? By being, you know, coming back to the you can hold, you can essentially create room for other people's expressions two ways, by being quiet and holding back, or by being expressive so that they know it's okay to do that. Right? And then beyond that, and some, some of you are maybe in positions where you don't really have people on your team, where it's all around you in your organization, where it's easy, and there's some really, really toxic cultures out there, uh, then to your point, sir, and find the others. Right? I mean, because there are around the world right now, I would say a million people at least, right, who are willing to create the future, are willing to go there, who want to be vulnerable, who want to live in a new way. So that's already happening. And even also, there's a bit of a generational shift happening. But right? if you look at some of the younger generation, they're much more accustomed to the idea that it's okay to share their feelings. Right? And the older generation, there wasn't much room for it. I mean, if you look at Germany in particular, for example, the whole post-war generation, uh, all those men who grew up there who are in leadership positions here today, um, oftentimes the father was either not there or you know, came back with PTSD from the war and wasn't accessible emotionally. Mom was usually building up the, the city again that just got bombed, right? so she wasn't there and available. A lot of those kids never got hugged. Right. Well, I look at certain, you know, uh, politicians in America at the moment where I'm like, I just wish they got more often as a kid, right? 
because they didn't have that available to them. They were used to suppressing their emotions. And so there's a generational thing that is always a little tricky. And again, lead by example and check in with them and care. And I think you can coax that out of everyone. Uh, I had a conversation years ago when I fought with my father when he retired. And he asked me, he's like, why is it that me and my friends feel like it's so sentimental now? You know, and I said, well, it's because you've been suppressing this for the entire career that you've had because you were taught to function and to show up and to not have emotions. But they're all there. They've always been there. Right? And now that once he retired and he didn't have that daily, I have to put my face on and go to work, once that was gone, suddenly he was allowing these emotions and they were coming up a lot. Right? If you look at old men, they get really weepy, really quickly. It's really sweet, actually. Right? Once they are past that, I have to pretend to be something. Mm -hmm. So create spaces for them, ideally with people who own it's difficult, ideally one-on-one -on -one initially, right, so that it's less threatening than in front of a team. But I do think that we have a generational shift there and there's more and more people who are willing to go there and find the others. Right. And, and I think energetically, this is the last kind of point on this topic and then we'll move, but what I would say is when you're doing all that holding, you're not doing creating. Mm. You're taking Absolutely. from that resource because you're suppressing so much. That's where the energy and the personal effort and the leadership is going. It's going to holding. Um, and so that's usually that's my motivation. Like if we want to come up with solutions for the future, if we want to innovate and make a better planet and speak to some of the themes that you discussed today, we need to increase our reserves and holding to the old is not going to do that in my humble opinion. Absolutely. Well, again, it starts with self-care, like really taking care of yourself reminding yourself that you, you are an awesome human being and you're here to learn and grow like everybody else, right? And you neither good nor bad, right? But that your job is to continue to grow and evolve yourself. And I love that quote, and I forgot the author too, that Gina just put in there, uh, in a society that profits from yourself, doubt, liking yourself is a rebellious act, right? And so this is really what you can start doing. It's like love on yourself, take care of yourself, be kind to yourself, right? I think because if you're not gonna do that, you can't really expect others to do it either. Right? And so I think starting there, and that gives you then the resilience and the support that you need to be okay with adversary. Right? Not necessarily all experiences. Right? Because people might not like you, or right? people might think you're totally free, people might give you evil looks, right? but you can always meet them with a smile and with a hug. Right? The other day I was in an occult conference, and as you can imagine, pretty much everybody was wearing black. And I was the only one white. It was super funny. But <laughs> actually looking at me with a little bit of an evil eye here and there. But I just looked at him and said, hey, someone's going to do it, you know, and play the fool. Right? And humor is a potent, wonderful tool to discharge tension. Right. I want to go to something that Gina said. You referenced the quote. Gina, not to put you on the spot, but um, do we think that this is how much, what percentage of society would we say is profiting from our self-doubt right now? And what is the equation that we want to get to? So, well, I mean, pretty much most of social media, right? I mean, it's all about pretty much every single one, every single person is an influencer right. on social media, it's pretty much profiting from the self doubt. Right. And so, we have to create a society that is not, you know, where little girls are not wondering if they're pretty enough, right? Or the boys don't wonder if they're strong and cool enough. That'll be a start, you know, but again, we have to create that by being examples of it in the first place. And there's some beautiful examples out there. I mean, like, for example, uh, you guys probably remember the Duff commercial, where they were one of the first people who started telling stories of real beauty, right, where they stopped using models, models, and they had just all kinds of women as models. Right? And I think those are kind of some beautiful examples of how we can begin to tell different stories. That's great. Um, and Kyle, I'm calling you out as well. All the freaky people make the beauty of the world. I could not, I could not believe that more. And I did not know that Michael Franti, um, mm -hmm. lyric, is there anything Kyle that you want to expand on that? Not to call you out, but I guess I am. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, hey there. Oh, yeah, I had to find the unmute button. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, Philip, always great to hear your voice and and see you radiate through the world um i uh yeah i've been exploring my own journey into more leadership and less management so this is right on point for me thank you very much 
Yeah. And Kyle, for the bit I know about you, you're a wonderful example of this too, right? I mean, you're a bit of a freak in that sense, and you've been different <laughs> than most people most of your life, right? And you've been willing to go there. And I think really that's that's key, right? And that really takes a tremendous amount of courage to find your own path and the work that you do. And Kyle has you know, worked with a lot of solar and things and really helping people create new ways of doing energy. Right. And we need people that are daring enough to go there and do things differently. So thank you for being one of the freaks who creates beauty in this world, Kyle. <laughs> any other any other freaks care to care to speak and be vulnerable as we have a couple of minutes left here? We'd love to hear your voices. Just raise your hand and I'll um unmute you. And if you don't, that's okay too. We can just uh pause and kind of reflect on everything that we've learned today. And I'll take a two minute bathroom break before you have your next meeting. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if there's no one else, um, and uh, oh, one more thing before we quiet. Uh, Kyle, yes, we can send out a copy of the recording and it'll I'm also- the the, slides. Yeah, I must show the slides decks as well. Um, I'm really touched um, by Philip's generosity, knowledge, um, presence, and vulnerability to go there, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and I want to thank all of you for showing up. Um, Philip is um, a part of our community, and we um, are trying to build a better community of leaders through Future Ready CMO. We'll be sending an email with recording and then some links for you to take a look at some of the future programming, um, a survey, a number of other things. But if this content resonates with you, we'd love to have you join more. We'll have one session a month beginning in January 2023. And Danka as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. It's a pleasure to have you here and create a new future. Let's you know, create your future. So be, 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 be. You be you. Yes. All right. Thanks, all. Have wonderful days and nights today. Goodbye. <laughs>